In the dimly lit corners of history, the Mafia has woven its web of power and violence. These criminal organizations have not only inspired chilling real-world headlines, but also iconic movies like The Godfather and The Sopranos. Despite relentless efforts by law enforcement, the Mafia has endured. So, who were the coldest, most ruthless leaders at the helm? And how did they maintain their iron grip on power? Join us as we unveil the secrets of history's most notorious Mafia bosses. Carlo Gambino. Carlo Gambino wasn't your typical flashy mob boss. In fact, if you met him on a street corner in New York City, you might mistake him for an ordinary guy. He was quiet, unassuming, and was even known for offering coffee and dessert to FBI agents who visited him at home. But beneath this calm exterior lurked a cunning and ruthless individual, one of the most powerful mafia bosses America had ever seen. Born in 1902, Gambino's Sicilian hometown was practically a mafia stronghold. The law had little sway there, and the young Gambino grew up steeped in the criminal underworld. In his late teens, he journeyed across the Atlantic to Brooklyn, New York, which was a hotbed of mafia activity in the 1920s. There, he fell in with the gang led by Joe the Boss, Masseria. However, Masseria wouldn't last long. A brutal power struggle known as the Castellamarie's War erupted, and Masseria was gunned down in a mob restaurant. Following this, Gambino quickly switched allegiances and joined forces with Masseria's rival, Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano's reign was just as short-lived. He too was assassinated, leaving the Mafia landscape fragmented. Gambino, determined to survive and climb the ranks, shifted loyalties once more, this time to the Mangano brothers who controlled a powerful Mafia family. But the Mangano brothers' leadership was tragically cut short when they were murdered on the orders of another ambitious gangster named Albert Anastasia. Even though Anastasia became Gambino's new boss, their partnership wouldn't be a smooth one, Anastasia, known for his volatile temper, broke a cardinal mafia rule. He ordered the hit of a civilian. This reckless act deeply disturbed Gambino, who believed it brought too much unwanted attention to their criminal activities. So, in a ruthless move to consolidate power, Gambino orchestrated Anastasia's assassination in 1957. With Anastasia gone, Gambino finally ascended to the top, becoming the boss of his own mafia family. Under his cunning guidance, the Gambino family grew into a vast criminal enterprise. Thousands of men, operating across the eastern seaboard, brought in immense wealth through gambling, loan sharking, hijacking, drug trafficking, and manipulating labor unions. Gambino's influence extended beyond his own family. He became a powerful figure within the entire New York Mafia scene, wielding influence over the other four major families. The chilling aspect of Gambino's reign was his ability to wield such immense power from the shadows. He rarely raised his voice or lost his temper. One time, when an associate named Dominic Schialo drunkenly insulted him at a dinner party, Gambino remained outwardly unfazed. Yet Schialo mysteriously disappeared soon after, only to be found later buried in concrete. This cold-blooded efficiency sent a clear message to anyone who dared to cross Gambino. Carlo Gambino lived a long life, dying in 1976 at the age of 74. He passed away peacefully in his Long Island home. This was a stark contrast to the violence that had colored most of his life. Remarkably, despite his life as a notorious mafia boss, he only served a brief prison sentence of 22 months. John Gotti John Gotti was ruthless and ambitious, clawing his way to the top of the Gambino crime family. But Gotti also had a flair for the dramatic, a side that earned him nicknames like the Dapper Don for his expensive suits and flamboyant style, and the Teflon Don for his uncanny ability to slip through the cracks of the legal system. Even today, he remains a captivating, if controversial, figure in American history. Born in the Bronx in 1940, John Gotti grew up poor and surrounded by crime. By the young age of 12, he was already running errands for the Gambino family a powerful mafia organization. Gotti wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He was known for his toughness and his willingness to take risks, qualities that caught the eye of Agnello Della Croce, the Gambino family's underboss. Della Croce became a mentor to Gotti, recognizing his potential and taking him under his wing. 
As Gotti climbed the ranks, tensions began to simmer between him and the Gambino family's new boss, Paul Castellano. Castellano was a strict traditionalist who disapproved of Gotti's flashy lifestyle and his involvement in drug trafficking, which Castellano saw as bringing unwanted heat from law enforcement. Things came to a head in 1985 when Della Croce, Gotti's close friend and supporter, died of cancer. Castellano, fearing a media frenzy, skipped the funeral, a move that deeply insulted Gotti. Castellano's leadership style also rubbed many in the family the wrong way. He was known for being reclusive and out of touch, and his cautious approach to business frustrated some of the more hot-headed capos and soldiers. Gotti, sensing an opportunity, began to quietly build his own power base. He cultivated relationships with capos within the Gambino family, who were unhappy with Castellano, and even reached out to leaders in other New York Mafia families for support. On December 16, 1985, Gotti made his move. In a brazen act that shocked the underworld, Gotti ordered the assassination of Castellano and his underboss, Thomas Bellotti, outside a Manhattan steakhouse. With this ruthless act, Gotti became the new boss of the Gambino family. However, his power grab wasn't without consequences. The heads of other Mafia families were furious that Gotti hadn't followed proper protocol by seeking their approval beforehand. This resentment would later lead to an attempt on Gotti's life. Gotti's reign as boss was far from smooth sailing. He continued to be a target for law enforcement and faced multiple racketeering charges. In 1990, he was finally arrested and charged with a whole laundry list of crimes, including the murder of Castellano. This time, however, Gotti's luck ran out. His own underboss, Sammy Gravano, disillusioned with Gotti's leadership and facing his own charges, turned state's witness and testified against him. The jury wasn't swayed by Gotti's carefully cultivated image. In 1992, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. John Gotti, the Teflon Don, would spend the rest of his days behind bars, eventually dying of cancer in 2002. Vito Genovese Throughout his life, Vito Genovese relentlessly pursued one ultimate goal, power. It wasn't just a desire for him, it was an obsession. Born in Naples in 1897, he arrived in New York City as a teenager, a wide-eyed immigrant stepping into a bustling new world. It wasn't long before he found himself drawn to the dark side of the city streets, falling in with a rough crowd and beginning a life of crime. Fate intervened when Genovese struck up a friendship with a young mobster named Lucky Luciano. The two men quickly became partners in crime, their ambitions intertwined. Back then, the New York underworld was a tangled web of rival factions vying for control. Genovese and Luciano initially threw their lot in with a powerful boss named Joe Masseria, but their loyalty would prove flexible, to say the least. As Luciano's vision for a more organized and profitable mafia grew, so did tensions with Masseria. Genovese soon saw an opportunity for advancement. In a now infamous incident, Genovese is believed to be one of the gunmen who ambushed and killed Masseria while he sat down for a seemingly harmless meal in a Coney Island restaurant in 1931. With Masseria gone, the path to the top was a little clearer for Luciano and Genovese. As Luciano's power and influence rose, so did Genovese's. He became a trusted lieutenant, a right-hand man, and eventually even served as acting boss of the Luciano crime family. However, Genovese's own criminal past caught up with him, forcing him to flee the country on a murder charge. He found refuge in Italy, leaving control of the family in the hands of Frank Costello. Genovese eventually returned to the United States, but things had changed in his absence. Costello, no fool, wasn't eager to relinquish power. Genovese, ever the opportunist, hatched a new plan. He approached his old friend Luciano, who was then living in exile in Cuba, and tried to convince him to grant him the ultimate prize, the title of boss of all bosses. But Luciano, perhaps wary of Genovese's ruthless ambition, refused. Undeterred, Genovese decided to take matters into his own hands. In a ruthless display of power, he backed another mob boss, Carlo Gambino, in the assassination of a rival, Albert Anastasia. He also tried to eliminate Costello through a hit, though the attempt failed. A shaken Costello, realizing the danger he was in, finally agreed to step aside making Genovese the official boss of the family that would bear his name. 
but Genovese's reign at the top was short-lived. In 1959 he was convicted on federal drug trafficking charges and sentenced to prison. Even behind bars, Genovese tried to maintain control of his criminal empire, but his grip on power had significantly weakened. He never walked free again and died of a heart attack in prison in 1969. Al Capone If you have never heard of Al Capone, then you haven't just been living under a rock, you have probably been buried beneath it. Al Capone, with his sharp suits and a scar etched across his cheek, was a gangster who carved his name into American history. Though his base of operations was in Chicago, not the usual stomping grounds of New York Mafia families, Capone's influence stretched far and wide. Born in Brooklyn in 1899 to Italian immigrants, Capone didn't start at the top. In fact, his journey into the dark underbelly of organized crime began with small-time errands for gangster Johnny Torrio, a man who would become a mentor to the young Capone. While Capone only dabbled in these activities as a teenager, he wasn't exactly known for angelic behavior. He was quick-tempered and easily landed himself in trouble. This recklessness became permanently etched on his face in 1917, when a man, angered by a remark Capone made about his sister, slashed him across the face. The Scar a constant reminder of that encounter, earned Capone the nickname Scarface, a name that would become synonymous with gangland violence for years to come. By 1920, America was gripped by Prohibition, a nationwide ban on the sale of alcohol. This, for enterprising criminals like Capone, was a golden opportunity. He left New York for Chicago three years later, allegedly to escape a revenge plot by the White Hand Gang after he beat up one of their members. In Chicago, he reunited with his mentor, Johnny Torrio. However, Torrio, after surviving a violent attack and a stint in prison, decided to step back from the criminal world and return to Italy. This opened the door for Capone's meteoric rise. He took the reins of Torrio's Chicago operations, effectively becoming the boss of the city's underworld. Under Capone's leadership, the Chicago outfit, as his organization was known, flourished. They made a massive fortune through the illegal production and sale of alcohol. They also branched out, controlling gambling rings and prostitution dens across the city. Capone, with his expensive suits and lavish lifestyle, cultivated a certain image. Some even saw him as a Robin Hood figure, a gangster who defied the unpopular prohibition laws and showered the working class with his ill-gotten gains. But this image masked a ruthless streak. Capone was a man of immense violence, capable of ordering brutal killings to eliminate rivals or silence anyone who threatened his operation. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929, where his men gunned down seven members of a rival gang in a cold-blooded display of powers, sent shockwaves through the nation and shattered any illusions about Capone's supposed benevolence. The public outcry was immense, and the government made capturing him a top priority. However, Capone's downfall wouldn't come from the gangland violence or the mountains of illegal booze. Ironically, it was the government's pursuit of tax evasion charges that brought him down. In 1931, he was arrested not for murder or bootlegging, but for failing to pay taxes on his immense wealth. He served time in Atlanta, but his health began to rapidly deteriorate due to a neglected case of syphilis. By 1934, he was transferred to the infamous Alcatraz prison. There, his mental and physical health continued to decline. By the time he was released in 1939, he was a broken man. He spent his remaining years in Florida, under the care of his wife, May. Al Capone died in 1947 at the age of 48. Sam Giancana Sam Giancana wasn't your average Chicago gangster. Sure, he rose through the ranks of the infamous Chicago outfit, the city's dominant mafia organization. But what truly set him apart were the whispers the whispers of a connection to a young, charismatic politician named John F. Kennedy. Born in 1908, John Connor's life began in the rough and tumble streets of Chicago. He fell in with a rough crowd early on, leading a gang of local youths called the 42 Gang. Their criminal activities were small-time at first, but they caught the eye of the biggest name in Chicago's underworld, Al Capone. According to Tony Montana, a former associate of Giancana's who spoke to the media in 2014. Giancana and his crew were making such a ruckus in the criminal underworld that Capone couldn't ignore them. Giancana started small, working as a driver for Capone's vast criminal enterprise. 
but he was a natural operator, cunning, and ruthless. He steadily climbed the ladder of the Chicago outfit, even after Capone's imprisonment in 1931. Giancana himself did some time behind bars, but upon release, he wasted no time consolidating his control over the Chicago mob. By the 1950s and 60s, he was a powerful mafia boss, but his ambitions stretched far beyond Chicago. Giancana's story takes a twist with his connection to JFK, supposedly through Judith Exner, a woman rumored to be Kennedy's mistress. Legend has it that Giancana and his crew lent a hand in Kennedy's 1960 election victory, allegedly by tampering with ballot boxes in Chicago. But the mobster's influence didn't stop there. He is said to have dabbled in plots to take out Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader who had angered the mob by shutting down their casinos in Cuba. And shockingly, whispers even suggest Giancana's involvement in Kennedy's own assassination in 1963. The rumors surrounding Giancana were so persistent that the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations sought to question him about his possible involvement in JFK's death. But tragically, Giancana would never get his chance to speak. On June 19, 1975, while preparing dinner at his own home, he was gunned down by an unknown assailant. To this day, the mystery of Giancana's murder remains unsolved. Was it a hit? ordered by rival mobsters? A jealous ex-girlfriend seeking revenge? Perhaps it was government agents, silencing a man who knew too much. The truth behind Giancana's demise may forever remain buried in the shadows, just like the man himself, Semyon Mogilevich. In the underworld of international crime, few figures loom larger or more enigmatic than Semyon Mogilevich. Mogilevich isn't a flashy figure barking orders from a mansion on a hill. Nicknamed the Brainy Don and the Boss of Bosses, Mogilevich is more like a shadowy puppeteer, quietly pulling the strings of a vast criminal empire. Standing at a stocky 5 feet 6 inches and perpetually trailed by a plume of cigarette smoke, Mogilevich's appearance is anything but intimidating. However, beneath this unassuming exterior lies a cunning intellect and a ruthless streak that has earned him the respect and perhaps fear of fellow mobsters around the world. Born in Ukraine in 1946, Mogilevich honed his criminal skills in the Lyubertskaya crime clan, a notorious group in the Soviet Union. After graduating from this school of crime, he established his own syndicate, the Solntsevo Gang. This group, known for its ruthlessness, would become a cornerstone of Mogilevich's criminal empire. Mogilevich, who is of Jewish descent, took advantage of the political and social upheaval of the 1980s. He allegedly stole millions of dollars from Jews desperately trying to flee the Soviet Union for Israel. This stolen fortune became the seed money for Mogilevich's sprawling criminal network, which encompassed both legitimate and illegitimate businesses. In the 1990s, Mogilevich set his sights on North America. He established YBM Magnex International in Canada supposedly a magnet manufacturing company with headquarters near Philadelphia. However, this company turned out to be a front. Mogilevich never even set foot in Philadelphia, and the company was nothing more than a web of lies designed to defraud investors out of $150 million. Mogilevich's criminal activities span the globe. Authorities in multiple countries have accused him of several crimes, including racketeering, fraud, money laundering, and even murder-for-hire plots. He has been linked to drug and weapons trafficking, and his tentacles have reportedly reached as far as the financial institutions of New York. In 1999, Russian authorities even accused him of laundering a half billion dollars through the Bank of New York. Back in his native Ukraine, he is suspected of being part of a corrupt gas import deal with high-ranking government officials in 2005. Despite the web of accusations and a place on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, since 2009, Mogilevich remains a free man. He is believed to be living comfortably in Moscow, protected by a network of powerful allies within the Russian government. With Vladimir Putin's Russia having no extradition treaty with the United States, it seems unlikely that Mogilevich will ever face justice for his alleged crimes. Vincent Gigante In the hustle and bustle of 1960s Greenwich Village, a peculiar sight became a familiar one for New Yorkers. A stooped figure, clad in a rumpled bathrobe, shuffled down the streets muttering to himself. This man, with his disheveled appearance and seemingly erratic behavior, gave every impression of being down on his luck, 
perhaps even mentally unstable. But for those who knew the truth, this was a carefully crafted performance. The man in the bathrobe was Vincent Gigante, a powerful mafia boss, and his act was anything but genuine. Born in New York City in 1928, Gigante's path to becoming a mafia boss wasn't exactly conventional. Some rumors claim his loyalty to Vito Genovese, a powerful mafia don, stemmed from a favor. Genovese allegedly helped Gigante's family by paying for his mother's surgery. Whatever the reason, Gigante quickly became a rising star within Genovese's ranks, earning the nickname The Chin, a shortened version of his Italian first name, Vincenzo. Gigante wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. In 1957, when Vito Genovese was vying for control of the Luciano crime family from Frank Costello, Gigante allegedly took matters into his own hands. He attempted to assassinate Costello. While the attempt ultimately failed, with a doorman reportedly identifying Gigante, Costello surprisingly refused to press charges or even identify his attacker. Genovese eventually wrestled control of the family, and Gigante's loyalty was further cemented. By the 1980s, Gigante had risen through the ranks to become the head of the Genovese family, one of the most powerful criminal organizations in the country. However, by this time, Gigante had also begun a bizarre performance. He knew he was under constant surveillance by law enforcement, so he started playing a part. The once feared mob boss transformed into a seemingly harmless eccentric. He shuffled around the neighborhood in his bathrobe, muttering incoherently, and even staged visits to psychiatrists, all in an elaborate act to convince everyone he was mentally unfit. This elaborate act went on for years, but law enforcement wasn't entirely fooled. They continued to build a case against Gigante. Finally, in 1996, a judge saw through the act and declared Gigante mentally competent to stand trial on charges of racketeering and murder. In 1997, after years of playing crazy, Gigante was found guilty and sentenced to 12 years in prison. He died behind bars in 2005, leaving behind a legacy as one of the more cunning and paradoxical figures in American Mafia history. El Mencho Mexico has been battling a brutal war for over a decade. It's not a war between countries, but a war waged by vicious drug cartels fighting for control of a multi-billion dollar criminal empire. These cartels aren't just slinging drugs on street corners. They're involved in a horrifying array of activities, from human trafficking and kidnapping to stealing oil and extorting businesses. Since 2006, this violence has left a trail of bloodshed, with more than 200,000 people murdered or vanished without a trace. The Mexican government has tried to crack down on these cartels with military force, but these efforts often seem like whack-a-mole. Push down one gang, and another pops up in its place. Corruption is rampant, with cartels bribing everyone from small-town police to high-ranking federal officials, making it difficult to truly dismantle their networks. Among these ruthless organizations, one cartel has risen to the top in recent years. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG for short. This cartel is a relatively new player, formed in 2010 by a group that broke away from the infamous Sinaloa Cartel. The leader of the CJNG is a man named Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes, better known by his chilling nickname El Mencho. El Mencho's path to power wasn't paved with privilege. Born into poverty in Mexico, he grew up picking avocados and never even finished elementary school. In the 1980s, he crossed the border illegally to the United States, but his dreams of a better life were cut short. He was arrested multiple times and eventually deported back to Mexico in the early 1990s. Back in his home country, he fell in with the Millennio Cartel, working his way up the ranks until he eventually became the leader himself. After several of his rivals were arrested or killed, El Mencho saw an opportunity and struck out on his own, forming the CJNG. El Mencho isn't just another faceless drug lord. He is notorious for his ruthless tactics and brutal violence against anyone who gets in his way, be it rival cartels or Mexican security forces. These public displays of savagery have made him a target, not just for the Mexican government, but for the DEA as well. He's now listed among the DEA's most wanted international drug traffickers, with a hefty reward on his head. El Mencho is a ghost, constantly on the move and protected by a fierce squad of heavily armed mercenaries, many of them with military training. Authorities believe he hides out in the rugged mountains of western Mexico, a fugitive kingpin who continues to fuel the flames of violence that have ravaged his country.
Nicky Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo wasn't an imposing figure. At a mere 5 feet 5 inches and 135 pounds, he could easily be mistaken for an unassuming short man on the bustling streets of Philadelphia. But beneath that exterior lurked a dark heart. A man who would become infamous for ruling the city's mafia with an iron fist dipped in blood. Scarfo's story began in Brooklyn on March 8, 1929. Born into an Italian-American family with deep connections to the Mafia, violence seemed almost woven into his DNA. After graduating high school, Scarfo wasted no time heading to Philadelphia to join his three mobster uncles. It wasn't long before the young Scarfo established a reputation for violence. Philadelphia's underworld was controlled by Angelo Bruno, a powerful yet relatively traditional Mafia boss. But in 1980 Bruno's world came crashing down when he was gunned down in a hail of bullets. This assassination, followed by the subsequent killing of Bruno's successor, Philip Testa, created a power vacuum in the city's mafia scene, and Nicky Scarfo was ready to step into the void. Scarfo capitalized on the newly legalized gambling scene in Atlantic City, turning it into a massive moneymaker for his criminal empire. But unlike other mafia bosses who relied on calculated ruthlessness, Scarfo ruled through fear. He reveled in violence, using it not just as a tool but as a twisted form of entertainment. Scarfo readily ordered the deaths of rivals and even his own associates, leaving their bodies displayed in public as a gruesome warning to anyone who dared to cross him. Even amongst the hardened killers of the Mafia, Scarfo was considered a hothead. In 1979, he orchestrated the murder of Vincent Falcone, an associate who dared to question his authority. Scarfo not only insisted on witnessing the execution, but reportedly watched the entire ordeal with glee, downing a whole bottle of scotch while exclaiming, I love this, I love it. These weren't isolated incidents. Scarfo once forced his 10-year-old nephew to help him dispose of a body, and on another occasion, stabbed a longshoreman to death in a bar fight with a butter knife. Scarfo's reign of terror eventually backfired, his brutality and unpredictable behavior bred resentment, even within his own organization. In the end, it was Scarfo's own nephew, along with other fed-up associates, who turned against him and testified against him in court. By the time he died in prison in 2017, Scarfo was serving a life sentence for a long list of crimes, including murder, extortion, and illegal gambling. Scarfo, no doubt, died a broken and forgotten figure, but the fear he instilled in Philadelphia's underworld would linger long after his death. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.